Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the sons of man. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before the Lord like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to their own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet He did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? for he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, 
he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. to your hands I commend my spirit Father into your hands I commend my spirit in you O Lord I see refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Into your hand, I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. scorn of my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Father, into your hands I come. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you who wait for the Lord. Father, into your
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord.
the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After they had eaten the supper, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. I am, am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and, the other, and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that time the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning, they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. 
Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, on your own or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, 
and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred weight. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb 
in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Praise be Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we gather this afternoon in prayer, faith, and devotion to honor the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though it was the saddest and most heart-wrenching day humanity had ever known, we still refer to it as Good Friday and not Bad Friday, since Jesus' love, Jesus' obedience, Jesus' self-sacrifice obtained for us reconciliation and redemption. By his wounds, we have been saved. The crucifixion was a most terrible event and the cruelest and most brutal form of execution. Besides one that involved many people and a lot of evil and sin. Almighty God, however, turned things around, really inside out and brought forth a new beginning, new hope, and a new life for those who come to repentance and to faith in Him. We receive the rewards of eternal life that Christ purchased for us by His unconditional love and His precious blood. Moreover, Today is the day set aside for us to consider not only how the Lamb of God who was slaughtered for the redemption of humanity in general, so much as how we, each one of us, played a role, played a part in its unfolding. During this liturgical season, Often we hear, we sing the popular hymn, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? It is a spiritual and said to have been most likely composed by enslaved African Americans in the 19th century. It poses very gripping and haunting questions to the believer. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? When we reflect on these questions, we can say perhaps, no. Realistically, chronologically speaking, physically, we were not there that Friday afternoon on the outskirts of Jerusalem on a hill called Calvary where Christ was murdered, where Christ accepted to give his life as a ransom for many. We couldn't have been there we were all born two millennia later. 
However, when we consider the plan of salvation for each one of us and that it was decided by the Lord from his eternal perspective and in his providential love, when we consider that Christ was indeed crucified on the cross for sins, for our sins, as well as the sins of all humanity from the beginning of time, and that he's descended from heaven precisely to atone for sins, then yes, in a certain way, in a certain real way, we were there. We were present. We participated spiritually and truly on that hill, that redemptive afternoon that changed the world forever. You see, when we consider Christ's sacrifice in the light of faith, we come to the conclusion that he did it for me and he did it for you. He did what he did for us out of love for us. St. Paul uses that expression often, for us, in Latin, pro nobis for us, underscoring the personal appropriation we need to do of the act of redemption. In Philippians chapter 2, St. Paul writes, Christ became obedient for us unto death, death, even to death, death on a cross. We heard the beautiful singing of this, of this phrase, Christus factus es pro nobis, pro nobis for us. Obedience, usque ad mortem, mortem autem crucis. Death, not only any death, death on a cross for us. It's too easy and too convenient today to brush it off of saying, oh, what a most unfortunate event that took place long ago in a far distant land and therefore not see we were part of that drama as well. Christ came into the world to save us simply because we needed it. This is the mo most basic message of the gospel along with God's unconditional love for us. To receive his salvation and welcome him as our Savior requires that we bring it home, that we make it personal. We admit and confess that we personally need a Savior. We welcome him into our hearts every day. Consequently, the cross becomes much more than a pendant around our neck, your beautiful work of art on the wall, or some kind of custom jewelry used to accessorize an outfit. It becomes for us the means of salvation. It becomes for us a powerful and unmistakable symbol of selflessness, of self-sacrifice, a positive sign of the new life and the way that Christ chose to show us the depth of his love on one side and the ugliness of sin on the other. He loved us to the end, fully, unreservedly, unconditionally, eternally. The cross is filled with meaning and hope for us. We pugnantly sing in the ancient hymn, Vexilla Regis Prodeunt, Ave, O Crux, Spes Unica, Hail to the cross, our only hope. There is no point 
in being overly sentimental or idealizing suffering in and of itself. We must recognize the suffering, not shy away from it. In faith, we embrace it. We unite it to Christ. And only in this way can it purify us, can it help us to grow in holiness and in Christ-likeness, can it expand our heart, rendering our lives more sensitive, humble, and transform us by God's grace. It's part of growing up spiritually since mature believers, holy men and women, are always extremely meek, compassionate, profound, and sensitive believers. Today is likewise the day during which we ask ourselves, what am I doing to help my brothers and sisters carry their cross? What must I do? What can I do? What am I being asked to do? During the dreadful communist era, the Russian Soviet dissident poet and writer Irina Ratushinskaya spent a number of years in Russia's horrendous labor camps. She subsequently penned the following words which are filled with gospel truth. The best way to retain your humanity in the labor camps was to care more about someone else's pain than your own. This highlights the point that true compassion is not learned without suffering. The Passion narrative relates what a number of compassionate people did to alleviate the sufferings of Christ. And we can learn a lot from them in alleviating the sufferings of the body of Christ the church and its members, truly, to care more about someone else's pain than ourselves. For example, Veronica. She came forward with the veil, with kindness and generosity to wipe the face of Jesus. Who do we know that needs for us to dry their tears, to heal the scars of their broken heart and their bruised face. Simon of Serene had the courage to step forward and carry the cross for Jesus. Who do we know that could benefit from, hum, from some heavy emotional and spiritual lifting from us hence make the suffering there that they are going through more bearable. The weeping women of Jerusalem were filled with sympathy and with heart for Jesus and his pain. Who do we know that would welcome a sympathetic ear, a kind visit, a friendly call, some time to talk and an opportunity to unload their fears and their hurts. The loyalty and closeness of the Apostle John and some of the women who followed him. Are there members of our own family, friends and community who are experiencing their own personal Good Friday and would appreciate a word of encouragement, a gesture of solidarity, and a fraternal closeness. And finally, the unique and life-giving support 
enduring love, and comforting presence of the Mother, Mother Mary, Miriam of Nazareth, now become Mater Dolorosa, the Sorrowful Mother. Is there anyone we know right now who needs compassion, mercy, hope, gentleness, and for us to stand resolutely by them, like Our Lady did with her son hanging on a cross, sharing their suffering and sorrow. Let me conclude with a story. It was a cold day in many ways. February of 1941, in the ominous site of Auschwitz in Poland. Saint Maximilian Kolbe, a Franciscan priest, had been arrested and thrown into the infamous death camp for helping Jews escape Nazi violence. Months went by and in desperation, one of the fellow prisoners escaped from the camp. The camp rule was enforced, and 10 people would be rounded up randomly and brought into a cell where they would die of starvation and a final injection of a lethal gas, so as to teach a lesson against any future escape attempts. A number of names were called, including that of a Polish military man, Franciszek Gaznonawczyk. He cried out with all of his soul, Please spare me, I have a wife and children. Father Colby did not hesitate a moment and stepped forward, saying, I will take his place. He was then unceremoniously escorted <clears throat> into, the cell, into the starvation cell with nine others, <clears throat> where he lived until the day of his execution, August 14, 1941. <clears throat> the story was covered by a nationally syndicated news outlet several years later. Mr. Gazovnacek, by this time 82 years old, was recorded telling his story. And as he's telling his story, tears streaming down his rugged cheeks. A video camera followed him around his little house to a monument he had built and beautifully decorated with flowers. The inscription on the monument was, in memory of Maximilian Kolbe, he died in my place. Every day, Gazovnacek lived from 1941 to 1995, the year he passed away, he lived with the knowledge and kept repeating, I live because someone died for me. And every year on August 14, he traveled to Auschwitz in memory of Father Colby and the supreme sacrifice he made so that he would live. It is the story of sin and suffering of justice and redemption, of holiness and martyrdom. And we recall readily what Jesus taught his disciples. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. What Kazovnacek would say personally about St. Maximilian Kolbe, each one of us can say personally of our Lord and God, I live because someone, because Christ 
died for me. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chosen for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Francis, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, 
increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, 
on lock prisons, loose and fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord.
Ecelinium crucis in quo salus mundi Ecelinium crucis in quo salus mundi pebe. Ecelinium crucis in quo salus mundi pepe.
at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter my room, but only say the word of my soul. Act of Spiritual Communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and a desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, you have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ. Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Personal adoration of the cross is an important feature in today's celebration. Just ask for your continued patience. If you would like to come forward to venerate the cross after the service, please follow the instructions of the ushers. Also this evening at 7 p.m. we will have the Stations of the Cross. All are welcome to join us in prayer. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. <laughs> 